Welcome to DBS Macro Insights live stream. It's 4 p.m. here in Singapore, and we're coming to you live from DBS Asia Central's Spark Studio. I'm here, Temur Beg, Chief Economist, and with me, Duncan Tan, Rate Strategist. Uh, we will spend the next hour or so going over the latest key macro developments and their implication for various asset classes. But since Duncan is with us today, we will spend a lot of time, Duncan, on Asia rates. And you will come in about half an hour's time and go over your slides. Okay. Uh, we'll see you a little later. Sure. And um, uh, so from our side, uh, what we will do is uh, go through a two-set presentation. First, the issue regarding the inflation and the growth dynamic growth slowing, inflation slowing, or is it really the case? Uh, and then uh, move on to a broader dis discussion on the key macroeconomic trends around the US dollar, around the growth picture, but also what does it mean for Asia and so on. We will also reserve a little bit of time to look at the Hong Kong dollar space. We've received a lot of question on the Hong Kong dollar peg and its uh, integrity, or is there sufficient reserves to back it up? Uh, we will dispel some of those concerns in the final few slides, and we have some very good questions, and we'll take that from you as well. All right, let's go over the slideshow now. Um, the macro narrative is as follows. Um, the inflation growth narrative, starting with the inflation discussion. Um, is there a chance that we are going to see a peaking of inflation? So look at this. What we have is a uh, five cross five inflation expectations chart on the expectations built around the markets from the UK, US, and Europe. And this is a chart covering about a nine-year period, starting all the way to 2014 to the middle of 2022. And as you can see, over the last eight, nine years, inflation expectations haven't really changed that much. Uh, in the US, way back in 2014, five cross five inflation expectations numbers were about 2.8% today about 2.8%. Euro area, 2.1 then, 2.3 now. Okay, you know, in the case of UK, just a little more, 3.6 versus 3.9. But by and large, um, despite all the discussion that central banks have been behind the curve, that they are risking undermining their credibility, that inflation expectations are on their rise, all of that so far have not really dented market-based expectations of inflation. That's the expectation side story, and which is important, because by the way, this is a long-term inflation expectation. This is what the market is expecting 10 years from now, and that is a critical component of what the Fed is targeting. But there are other areas, actual inflation, near-term expectations, as opposed to long-term expectations, and we'll go through them momentarily. But first, take a look at the growth picture, because today's presentation is about both growth slowdown and peak inflation. In a way, they're like two sides of the same coin. Growth slows, demand slows, and even if there are supply side issues, inflation sooner or later is bound to peak. And when we look at economic surprise data, I don't think there's much surprise about the Euro area and China uh, dipping down. Uh, this is a composite of data surprises. This right-hand side chart is showing that in the case of Eurozone, which is a dark black line, and China, which is the gray line, you know, both have headed south, and I think it's fairly safe to say in the coming months, we probably don't see any upside as far as Eurozone is concerned. Perhaps some upside in China, but not a whole lot more because they have their share of headwinds, not just COVID, but other things as well. Uh, but uh, what about the US? Has the US economy been doing extremely well? Yes, but when it does very, very well, then expectations get on the northern side and therefore the chance of disappointment comes in as well and that's what we're seeing as far as the u.s data is concerned um, now there are many many types of inflation out there so i want to spend a couple of minutes talking about varieties of inflation because that is an important thing to know when we are talking about inflation peaking what kind of inflation is peaking so first there's the COVID inflation the pandemic related uh, supply chain problems that we saw, uh, the huge policy support that boosted uh, consumer savings, particularly in the West, but also here in Singapore, which led to increase in buying power and massive demand for goods because people were staying at home at the expense of services. But now there's a reverse COVID inflation. As COVID ebbs, as it becomes what we call endemic, people switch from goods demand to services demand. And any of you who have tried to buy a an airfare ticket, air ticket for the summer break, know how those service prices are now going through the roof. So these are all pandemic-related inflation. 
I think we can say to some degree, with, with some degree of confidence, that this will pass. Uh, we are not going to stay indoors forever. We're not going to have unbalanced supply demand with respect to goods and services. We will go back to normal uh, in, in a year or two, maybe even earlier. Uh, it's just a matter of time. Don't worry about that. Um, then there is the Ukraine war-related inflation or conflict inflation. Uh, we have had issues in energy supply. We worry about uh, Russia being a major supplier of gas and crude oil to the world, as well as a variety of other uh, agriculture commodities. So there is a dark cloud over energy supply and agriculture supply because of the war in Ukraine, not least the fact that U Ukraine itself is a very large producer of wheat around the world. And all this concern is percolating into uh, energy and food nationalism, if you will. We've heard about India banning exports of sugar and wheat. We have heard Indonesia considering banning palm oil. Uh, here in Singapore, we're dealing with Malaysia banning exports of chicken for a month. So a lot of things are happening around the world, uh, and some of it has been precipitated by that concern that began to spike around the war in Ukraine. And then there's the issue of the flight to safety. You go start buying things that you uh, think will are safe harbors in turbulent times, and those prices also go up. So that's the uh, conflict-related inflation. But both COVID and conflict inflation ought to be something that we can deal with. Wars don't last forever. Pandemics are overcome through vaccination and, um, and of course, herd immunity by most of us getting it. Uh, but these are not the only reasons why we worry about inflation. Then there is climate inflation. Nothing to do with the war in Ukraine. But by and large, you do want high taxes and regulation to push up fossil fuel prices so that the transition to green energy makes sense from a market perspective. And we will see this more and more going forward. Carbon taxes, border adjustment taxes, uh, all of those things would feed into perhaps higher fossil fuel prices, which will keep that side of inflation high, but perhaps for a greater good as we are sort of motivated to move toward uh, greener energy sources. But then, in general, we are seeing record droughts around the world. Just in Singapore recently, we had some of the hottest temperatures we've seen in living memory. India is suffering from a historic drought. And all of these things also lead to agriculture failure, food supply issues, and chronic rise in prices. So we have to keep that in mind as well. It's not just about carbon taxes. It's also about natural disasters and uh, global warming uh, causing havoc with respect to food supply. And then there's a demand for green tech issue. Uh, we are looking forward to an electric vehicle future uh, in which we will consume a lot of batteries. Batteries consume a lot of rare earth and minerals. Those prices will also go up. So there's a whole green aspect. The transition itself will lead to some degree of high inflation. And finally, there's the issue of structural inflation. As labor force shrink due to aging in countries like China or Singapore or Europe, would that mean the Remaining labor force have to be paid a lot more. Well, then that would create higher wages and inflation. Uh, if China uh, starts to become more and more expensive, as it, as it has because of its own success, well, then China's role in keeping manufactured good prices may sort of start fading. And also the whole deglobalization dynamic, we're going for resiliency as opposed to efficiency. And that can also lead to redundancy and inefficiencies, which then fuel into inflation. So lots and lots of factors which make one worry that even if we're talking about peak inflation on a cyclical basis right now in the second half of 2022, but for 23, 24, 25, we probably will have quite a few headaches around inflation. All right. Then there are issues related to key inflation markers. Firstly, core inflation, something that Fed officials watch very closely. And as you can see in this chart that I have, that core PC inflation in the US, the red line, and trim mean PC, which is something that the Dallas Fed prefers to look at, have all come down quite a bit after peaking in March of this year. Uh, then there is the issue of freight costs, something that we saw uh, becoming a very big source of um, concern within the supply chain when uh, moving a container from Shanghai to LA was costing something in the range of uh, $12,000, uh, you know, late 2021. Well, those things have come down quite a bit. It's about $9,000 now. Uh, it's not great. Uh, great is when it's like, you know, $2,000, but it's come down. So inflation at the end is change in prices, not the level. So this will help matters a bit. Then the big commodity question. So this chart over here that I'm looking at right now at the bottom right corner is looking at four key commodities, uh, crude oil, gold, soybean, and wheat. 
Crude oil, the dotted red line, of course, is the most elevated right now. We have a lot of concern about Russian oil exports being restricted in various parts of the world, and would OPEC have sufficient energy supply? Still lots of concerns out there. I think from a macro sense, there is enough oil in the world without Russia to take care of things. But from a micro market development perspective, it's not quite working out immediately. U.S. shale producers are yet to go full steam. Uh, we heard some announcement from OPEC recently to increase their supply by a few hundred thousand barrels. But I think we need a couple of million barrels of oil to come to the market. Till that happens, that red dotted line remains fairly high. So that's one source of concern. But then the other three areas, gold, soybean, and wheat, food and precious metals, uh, the worst I mean, I'm saying it with you know, major firm crossing of my fingers, but the war seems to be behind us. Um, that you know, we have priced in the likelihood of supply-related uncertainty coming out of Russia, Ukraine, uh, and also we're not running to safety, at least toward gold, as a hedge against inflation the way we normally have done in past cycles. So if we believe that some of the big markers of inflation are peaking, uh, does that mean that our expectation of Fed policy is also peaking? Well, if you look at market-based pricing of Fed expectation, the answer is yes. So starting in late last year, for about five months, we had relentless upward revision of what we expect the Fed to do. But then in the last month or so, through May and early June, we're seeing flattening out. So that's the red line, 2022 high expectations, are now sort of flattening around 275 basis points or so. And as far as the 2023 high expectations are concerned, in the last few weeks, the market has started to price out entirely, meaning all rate hikes that happen in this cycle will happen this year, and that's it. The Fed will not be able to do that. We're not quite in this camp yet. We think the Fed will be hiking through this year and maybe early next year as well, taking the Fed funds rate to 3.5%. The market has given up on that. They're basically saying three-ish and done. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but certainly it's associated again with that peak inflation narrative. And then if you believe that rates have a, a you know, terminal point no further than, say, 3% or 2.7% this year, and then it ends, then perhaps you will stop being super bullish on US dollar, which has, of course, had a relentless rise uh, th through 21 and 22. Uh, perhaps that is, again, another sign that you know, the dollar cycle may also be peaking. Um, so around this, this high rates in the US, worries about inflation in the US, uh, it's been very turbulent for emerging markets. Uh, so what I'll do now is take a look at uh, debt, equity and debt flows into key uh, Asian markets where data are uh, available amply. And what you can see in the left-hand side panel, I mean, you can't really see it very well because China dominates this chart so much, but China in 19, 20, 21, which are the green, red, and uh, blue, red, and green bars here, received, 40, 60 billion dollars worth of inflows. Uh, this year, virtually nothing. You keep to look really, really close to see the little purple bar out there. Uh, Indonesia has gotten a little bit. India has seen massive equity outflows. South Korea has seen, actually, the last three years of equity outflows. Thailand, a little bit of inflow. Vietnam, nothing to write home about. And on the debt side, uh, Indonesia and India both have seen quite a bit of outflows. Thailand, a little bit of inflows. I'm not going to talk too much about the Thai debt story. Duncan is coming in a minute. He will uh, talk about uh, that, that story in greater detail. I do want to talk about one issue related to uh, Asia, which is you know, the China slowdown story around COVID, around tech regulation, around property market problems, uh, and, and of course the fact that you know, we probably will get an exceptionally low growth rate out of China for Q2. Should we worry a lot about that here in Asia? And my answer is, don't worry too much. Uh, what you're seeing on this chart is what we call a growth beta exercise. You know, for every single percent of debt growth fl fluctuation in China, what do Asian countries' growth move by? Similarly, for every percent move of the U.S., how much do Asian growth uh, move by? And the answer here is absolutely clear, with the exception of Indonesia and South Korea. For every single country here, Hong Kong, India, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, etc., U.S. matters much, much more than um, China. And the reason for that is simple. U.S. is a very, very large market. A lot of the stuff that we produce here go to the U.S., and U.S. is also a very good proxy for global demand beyond China. And therefore, I think this exercise is picking up that rest of China demand, which holds up pretty well. And, and China still is not that big a source of final demand goods for Asian countries. We spend, uh, send a lot of things to China, but a lot of that then ends up going somewhere else. 
it's a part of the supply chain process as opposed to just ending up in China. So we have exports out of Asia to non-China world, Europe, non-China Asia, US, Africa, holding up pretty well. We'll have a huge pickup in tourism. I'm gonna share with you a slide momentarily on that. And we are sort of living with COVID. I'm gonna share a slide with you on that too. But between those three factors, I think there is some degree of upside remaining for Asia, despite the doom and gloom coming from uh, Fed uh, interest rate hike and the strong US dollar. Exports outlook in Asia. Um, as I said earlier, it's kind of holding up. As you can see, regional PMIs, when you weight them for GDP and take a composite one, which is a black line here, uh, is still about 50, uh, despite the fact that you know, China has dragged it down substantially. It's holding up. Manufacturers are not that worried about inflation or fading demand in the West. Uh, and you know, exports growth a year ago was up by like 50, 60 percent. So, so very, very adverse base effect right now. And despite that, it's holding up, up about 10, 11% on a year-on-year -year basis. We got some new numbers out of Vietnam uh, this week. Again, looking pretty decent, uh, despite all the headwinds in place. So exports outlook, not as robust as it was last year. How can it be, given that 2020 was a total bust? But the fact that we're growing on top of a very strong growth year last year is a very good signal in my view. Uh, I said earlier that I was gonna talk a little bit about tourism. There's a lot of worry that you know, the Chinese tourists are not coming because of the pandemic. Uh, Russian tourists are not coming because of the sanctions. Uh, is that very bad news for Asia? Well, it's not good news, but it's not that bad news either. Why? Because there is a ton of tourists coming to Asia from Asia, from non-Russia, uh, Eastern Europe, and Western Europe, and on the US as well. So as you can see in this chart, I'm looking at Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand. And in all of these cases, the black bar, which is China, is important, but even if you make it disappear altogether, you still have very, very large chunks coming from intra-Asian travel. ASEAN country citizens seem to be traveling within ASEAN a lot. Uh, and then, of course, there is uh, Japan, Korea, tourists from there, and then the Americans and Western Europeans. Uh, try getting a ticket to Bali, and you will see what I mean. Tourism is actually doing pretty well in the region, but that also is a big upside for the rest of the year. And then the issue of the pandemic. Uh, I used to show this chart a lot last year. I stopped doing it this year because we were sort of moving on with COVID, but I think it is important to share with you again with an update uh, through end of May. What this chart shows to you in the horizontal axis, the total number of cases in various Asian economies. Not really important to look at what those numbers are anymore. It was a lot. And on the vertical axis, what we see is the flow, the last five days average number of cases. Again, the actual numbers are not important. What is important is the shape of the chart. In just about every single case, with the exception of China, which is colored here in black, it, the pattern is the same, which is we have had a big rise in infection, and now we are dropping like a brick. So uh, Omicron and its AB2 or whatever the variants are notwithstanding, uh, we're living with it. Uh, we're not crowding our hospitals. Our health systems are not under stress. Uh, we are moving on with the pandemic. COVID may not be over. But as far as Asia is concerned, it is not a major source of downside. That's the important thing that we can say. Unlike 20 or 21, between the various variants, delays with vaccination, we had a lot of negatives coming from the pandemic. This year, it's not a positive yet. We're not fully free, but it's not a major source of drag either. So that's my macro narrative. I'm gonna come back later, both for the Q&A section as well as for the Hong Kong dollar section. But for now, Duncan is back. Duncan, Asia Race View. I'll hand over the Thanks. remote to you. Right, so uh, on this slide, uh, in the top table, I have the one-month returns as well as the year-to-date returns for Asia as well, some of the EM local currency government bonds. Uh, and then the bottom chart, that, that is the year-to-date trajectory. So as you can see, this year has not gotten any easier for Asia or broader EM bonds. Uh, it has been quite rough. Uh, it, it has been almost a perfect storm where you have a hawkish Fed, you have Russia, Ukraine, you have higher oil prices, uh, you have China... China-related worries that is really weighing on uh, the bonds in this space. And then I, I think some, some, some of the more global kind of headwinds are, uh, are quite well discussed already. So uh, in the following slides, we will talk about some of the Asian regional kind of headwinds that we see. So uh, the first headwind is, we think, is Asian inflation. So based on our inflation surprise indices, uh, I, I think it's quite clear that 
in the region, uh, inflation expectations are too low relative to actual prints. So we have been underestimating inflation uh, for quite a few months already. And, and the extent of this underestimation has actually been getting increasingly larger, uh, as you can see by the, the rising lines on, on, on these charts over here. And, and even in China, uh, for the longest time during the pandemic, uh, inflation was surprising to the downside, but now we are starting to see inflation in China actually surprised to the upside. And then the second headwind, um, Asia headwind that um, I'm going to talk about was uh, mentioned earlier by Timer as well, uh, and, and that is foreign bond outflows. So on the left chart, that is uh, foreign outflows across the different uh, Asia local currency government bonds. Now, of course, do China dominates things, uh, but uh, in March, April, and May, we're seeing large outflows, not only in China, but, um, but also from Thailand bonds, Indonesia bonds, Malaysia bonds, and then on the right chart, what I have over there is uh, foreign holdings of uh, Asia bonds as a percentage of uh, G4 central bank balance sheets. So as you can see, uh, ever since the, the drawdown in the early parts of the pand pandemic, uh, this proxy has stayed rel relatively stable, suggesting that you know, actually uh, global sentiments towards Asia bonds ha ha have not really recovered. And, and if we were to look ahead and think about what's going to come in the coming months, you, the Fed has started to do quantitative tightening. Uh, G4 central bank balance sheets are going to string, so that's not going to bode well for uh, foreign inflows into Asia bonds. And then the third headwind I'm going to talk about is uh, valuations. So valuations uh, right now are not cheap. Um, so so it, it may be a bit of a surprise because bond yields have certainly risen a lot this year. But but then one one thing we we we, we track is that you know we realize is that actually bond risks have actually gone up a lot more as well. So after you adjust for the bond risk. Uh, such as you know, external balances, inflation, fiscal, uh, actually Asia bonds are not cheap. Uh, they were cheap at the start of the year, but that valuation buffer has compressed sharply over the course of this year. So as you can see, most of these lines, they are roughly at a levels that are um, kind of average or slightly below average compared to their last five year historical. And then on real money positioning, uh, so, so we see that in the EM space, actually real money uh, managers are generally quite underweight Asia. So for example, on the bond side, uh, the biggest underweight is in Thailand bonds. Uh, second biggest underweight is uh, in Indonesia bonds, whereas they, they are overweight bonds like uh, Brazil, South Africa, Mexico. And then on currency positioning, uh, real money is uh, most underweight, the CNY, followed by the Thai baht. Uh, and, and then they have small overweights in, in um, Brazilian real, in Mexican peso. So, so I think the read across is that uh, generally investors are quite uh, relatively more bearish Asia bonds and more bullish uh, other EM bonds. Uh, I, I think the main rationale is that for some of these uh, EM bonds that are outside of Asia, for example, Brazil, Mexico, they have started hiking rates last year already. So they, they have already done a lot of rate hikes. Uh, they are much more advanced in their hike cycles and they have already built up substantial buffers in terms of the, the carry that the bonds offer. And then going into some of the individual markets, uh, firstly, uh, China rates. Uh, I, I think the investment thesis for China government bonds has totally flipped in, in the last few months. So, so not so long pre ago, um, I, I think for much of the pandemic, you know, I think China CGBs were conviction long uh, for most investors uh, because yields were previously quite high and falling. And then your CNY was also, uh, for most parts, you know, what appreciating uh, uh, most of the time, uh, one-sided appreciation. But that has totally flipped in the, in the last few months where uh, CGB, CGB yields are now relatively low to the rest of the world. And then you, we're seeing some CNY volatility as well. So uh, I think the way we look at China rates uh, for the rest of the year is that uh, I, I think if China rates fall, there's a small room to fall. But if they rise, the room to rise is much larger. So we are biased to actually pay uh, ideas on, on China rates. And, and we think that you know, the, the, the entire narrative, whether is it whether, when we look at the economics, uh, fiscal, as well as monetary, we, we think you know, the, this is quite a convincing case uh, to support a, a view that you know, China rates will be higher uh, over the course of this year. Um, in terms of growth, I, I think it's 
uh, our expectation is that in the second half of this year, economic activity will start to normalize. Uh, that will allow China rates to, to, to bounce a bit. Uh, and then on, on the fiscal side of things, uh, we are expecting government bond issuances, central as well as local, to be quite heavy in 3Q of this year. So there will be quite a bit of uh, duration supply that the market has to absorb. And then on, on monetary support, we think that you know, uh, there's unlikely to be much more support on the monetary front. Um, I, I think in terms of policy rate cuts, uh, specifically to seven-day reverse repo as well as a one-year MLF, I think the window has narrowed a lot already, especially considering that you know, the global backdrop is still of uh, global rate hikes. Uh, so room for, the window for rate cuts has narrowed. Uh, liquidity right now, if you look onshore liquidity, it's, pretty much, it's as good as it gets. Really. It's not going to get much better beyond this. And then um, I, I don't discount the possibility that we may get a couple of triple R cuts. But then even if we do see the triple R cuts, we, markets are not going to take that as an indication that you know, there will be much more uh, deeper easing measures to come. So I, I don't see that you know, actually pushing CMY rates lower as well. So for the rest of this year, we, we actually have a, a pay bias on CMY rates. We think that we higher in the second half of this year. And then on India rates, um, I think for India rates, the general perception is that uh, it, it should be higher. Uh, and, and I think there are really good reasons for, for that kind of a view. So the RBI has recently pivoted uh, towards uh, fighting inflation uh, and, and supporting growth becomes uh, something of a, a, a secondary relative to their inflation uh, target. So, and, and then they are also doing a lot of uh, measures on tightening liquidity. Um, and as well, you know, bond markets are also worried about the supply this year, uh, which is expected to be quite heavy. And as a result, you know, there's going to be quite a bit of healthy demand to actually pay INR swaps to, to hedge some of the bonds that are going to come onto the market. So uh, I think those are very good reasons to be, to be bearish in their rates. Uh, but at the same time, uh, my, 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 percept, my view is that there's a lot that's already priced in uh, into the swap curves already. A lot of rate hikes, a lot of risk premium around the bond supply. So I, I feel that from this point onwards, it's going to be quite hard to beat what is already priced in. So on India rates, uh, we're generally still quite neutral. Uh, and then if, if they actually rise some more, I think it could be a, a good opportunity to, to look into receiving opportunities. And then for Indonesia rates, uh, I think something that we frequently hear a lot is that you know, the yield spread that Indonesia bonds currently offer, uh, it looks quite tight relative to historical whether you compare it against U.S. Treasuries or you compare it against uh, some of the other Asian bonds. Uh, so I, I, I would tend to disagree with that because I, I think the much compressed yield spreads that, that we see nowadays is really a reflection of the continuous improvement in, in macro fundamentals that Indonesia has been able to achieve over the last few years. So, so I wouldn't take that as a... a, a a com small, the tighter yield spreads to, to mean that you know, Indonesia bonds actually has a smaller valuation buffer. In fact, I think right now, if I look across most of the Asia bonds, I think there's no denying that uh, Indonesia bonds have one of the best fundamentals around. Whether you look at fiscal growth, inflation, external balances, real yields, they actually rank quite well across the region itself. So uh, we, are, we are quite positive on Indonesia government bonds fundamentals, but for the present, we, we think we'll, we'll probably stay neutral for now because... Um, no doubt the fundamentals are great, but we, we think that you know, in the current two, two to three months kind of time, time frame, you know, uh, the external backdrop is, if you consider that we're going to see the Fed hiking rates more, the Fed is going to do quantitative tightening, uh, we're going to see global liquidity actually tighten as well. It's not going to be a supportive kind of a risk backdrop uh, for uh, higher beta bonds to, to actually perform uh, well in this kind of environment. And, and something that uh, was also mentioned earlier that uh, we, we, we are, we're still seeing some outflows uh, from EM bond funds. And, and the thing is, uh, Indonesia bonds actually have the maximum weight in most of these uh, uh, bond benchmarks. So if there are outflows from the EM bond funds, then you know, fund managers don't, don't really have much of a choice but to, to sell some of their holdings to meet the redemptions. And then on, on Korean rates, uh, so, so our view on Korean rates has, has fundamentally changed since the, since the last uh, the May Bank of Korea meeting. Uh, I, I think in that meeting, uh, BOK turned out to be quite a bit more hawkish than we expected. Uh, right now, they are solely focused on fighting inflation. Um, and 
uh, the governor has also said that you know that he thinks that you know 2.5 percent uh, policy rate by end of this year is, is is quite reasonable. So so we think that's going to put a uh, uh, flaw and like high expectations that will allow the market to to push the pricing much higher. So so actually for Korean rates, we actually think that you know it it, it could be a, a a good idea to actually. Uh, look, look at paying Korean rates uh, for the second half of this year. Um, an another reason as well is, is that you know, our inflation surprise in this actually show that uh, if we look at inflation across the region, actually in Korea, uh, inflation is the most underestimated um, compared to rest of the other economies. So we think that for the second half of the year, there's going to be uh, a lot of scope for this inflation expectations in Korea to catch up to uh, actual prints, and, and that would be a good trigger you know, for Korean rates to actually push higher. Uh, and, and then on, on the bond side of things, uh, I, I think Korean bonds have been underperforming for many quarters. Um, and, and so far this year, in 1H, uh, it's still pretty much the same story, where uh, from a total returns perspective, Korean bonds are still trying to fight uh, challenges on the balance of payment front, where uh, no doubt that Korea has a very strong current account, um, but then they're they are seeing uh, very large uh, investment porf portfolio investment outflows in equities. You know whether is it by foreigners or locals. So th so that's going to be quite challenging uh, ahead as well, especially if you consider that some of the local outflows is actually structural in nature. You know, for example, the National Pension Service uh, needs to continuously diversify into overseas investments. Uh, so so the, I, so what we're going to look for is uh, foreign equity inflows. If we start to see a turnaround, then maybe we can start to be a bit more bullish on, on Korean bonds. Um, and, and on the next slide, I have uh, Singapore rates. Uh, so on the, on the left chart, uh, there's a, um, the red line is actually our Sing dollar SORA two-year swap, and the black line is uh, uh, USD SOFA two-year uh, swap. So, so we have, we've, we've seen that you know, this year, start early parts of this year, uh, actually, our sing rates uh, actually done quite well. Not too bad in the sense that sing rates went higher, but we went higher by a lesser extent compared to uh, some of the global markets. So, which is why you're seeing that you know US two-year SOFA rates have actually shot up above uh, sing SORA two-year rates. And, and now, right now, there's a, there's a quite a healthy spread between uh, the two SOFA rates itself. So, um, we think moving forward, probably the, there's some risk that you know this. Spread Discount between uh, that you, right now the Sing Sora rates are trading at a discount to US SOFA. Uh, we think there's some risk that this gap could actually close uh, because in the short term, you know, I, I think uh, we're expecting that you know that we, we could continue to see some uh, continued volatility volatility in global equity markets, uh, and, and then you know uh, if we also get a, a stronger US dollar as well, uh, usually our Sing rates you know will tend to underperform. Uh, and then, and then, on on um, from a more domestic perspective, I think in in onshore, it, it does seem to us that you know uh, liquidity ten is appearing to be quite tight. So I, I think in the coming two to three months, you know, uh, sing rates could could start to underperform a bit. Uh, uh, but this is something that we are a risk that we are looking out for. And then on 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 Thailand rates itself, so Thailand. For uh, Thai rates is uh, a, a bit unique in the sense that uh, I, I think most people expect that Bank of Thailand will be uh, one of the last to hike rates. Uh, our economists expect Bank of Thailand to achieve lift off uh, next year, so th they will be on hold for for the rest of this year at a 0.5 percent kind of a, a policy rate. Uh, because uh, from the central bank's perspective, you know uh, growth. Is still, is still quite weak, so they, they feel like they still need to support growth. Um, so so uh, I, I think in, in, in the recent months, you know, when we look at some of the Thai baht uh, onshore OISs, uh, they have climbed higher. Uh, they they uh, definitely pricing for higher rates ahead. Uh, but but we think that right now, uh, in terms of market pricing, you know, uh, I, I think pricing is still for Bank of Thailand to stay quite dovish for the rest of this year, and then probably they will turn somewhere uh, start of next year. Uh, because when we compare two-year to five-year swap spreads across the Asia region, include US as well, uh, you can see that in Thailand's case, actually the spread is uh, relatively high compared to some of the other um, um, Asian markets. So the way to think about this is uh, 
the lower the spread, the more front-loaded the price hikes are. So in Thailand's case, um, in some of the other Asian markets, because hikes are being front-loaded, so, so that's, the spread tends to be more, the curve tends to be flatter, and, and uh, your two-year, five-year swap spread tends to be tighter as well. So you see in this case, actually, for Thailand, the two-year, five-year swap spreads are, are quite high. Uh, in fact, they're close to the five-year uh, max levels. So, so we think right now, um, a, a hawkish pivot by Bank of Thailand is not yet being priced in. Uh, it, it could be in the second half of, the, of this year, but, but for now, we're still inclined to think that you know, Bank of Thailand will still stay dovish and keep the policy rate at 0.5%. So, so we think that it could be a good idea to actually you know, receive some front-end spreads, uh, some front-end swaps to extract the carry and roll down you know, as long as you know, Bank of Thailand keeps the policy rate at 0.5%. And then in the second half of this year, it, if at any point in time, it starts to uh, look likely that you know, Bank of Thailand could, could pivot hawkish, uh, then I, I think at that point, we think it would be a good idea to immediately swap, switch to a, some kind of a uh, swap curve flattener to, to position for the front loading of rate hikes, you know, the moment Bank of Thailand is going to pivot hawkish. Right, so, so that's all I have uh, right now for the Asia rates, and I'll pass it over to Simon. Thank you, Duncan. Before yep. you go, uh, let me ask you one question on the rate side. Sure. So the U.S. rates uh, picture, the market is getting a bit, you know, cold feet. Mm -hmm. And as you saw in the chart that I showed that for 2022, the expectation is, you know, up to 275 basis points in rate hike and perhaps no rate hike at all in 2023, right. which is not our call, but at least that's right. what the market is right. pricing in. So for a country like Thailand that you mentioned that, you know, we don't think they will even entertain a rate hike till next year. They just might get away with it by not doing anything. Right. Um, I, I, I think generally in in Asia's case, uh, not just Thailand. I, I think most countries in Asia could get away with um, um, being a bit be, behind the Fed in the sense that I think if you compare Asian central banks versus the Fed, I think this for this year, I think most people are expecting that the Fed is going to hike way more than most of all of the Asia central banks uh, uh, in, in the region itself. And, and I, 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 I don't think that would be a, a, a massive uh, ch challenge or difficulty in the sense that um, I think what we have seen recently is that some of the Asia central banks are, are starting to use their, uh, intervene in the FX markets to sort of smoothen the, the volatility in their currencies. So for, uh, for, uh, for the currency side, I, I think it's okay because I think FX reserves is something that we have a lot of in Asia. Uh, we have definitely accumulated a lot of uh, FX reserves during the pandemic. So if, if let's say, you know, we see our currencies are a bit weaker, breaking key levels, uh, I, I think central banks, uh, we, and we've seen it uh, in the last few months, will actually come in to, to sell some of the FX reserves and, and try to support their currencies a bit uh, so that it doesn't uh, turn out into a, a financial stability risk that, where they have to worry about outflows. And, uh, and then on the interest rate side of things, um, I, I think generally in Asia, in, in, in the Asia region, most of the bonds are, are, are considered quite uh, uh, um, well rated in terms of credit. So uh, compared to some of the other bonds in, in um, emerging market space, I think there's going to be less pressures uh, for central banks to try to match the Fed on rate hikes one for one. So two decades, like more than two decades ago, when the Asian financial crisis took place, the view at that time was, if there's a lot of capital outflow, you hike rates to defend it, even if that means the economy will slow down. It seems to me in the last two plus decades, the thinking has changed that nobody wants to defend their currency by matching the Fed with interest rate hike, uh, take some depreciation, do some intervention. So more of a mixed bag policy right. response. Um, and in terms of countries like India, which is different from, say, in Indonesia or Malaysia, as in India is a very large importer of commodities. Would that play into the RBI's uh, view that, you know, maybe they need to defend the exchange rate? Otherwise, A, the cost of import goes up a lot, and B, there's pass-through risks? Right. Um, I think in the last few months, we've definitely seen uh, not just RBI, but some of the a Asian central banks also uh, um, getting a bit worried that, you know, if, if they allow their the currencies to depreciate too much, then they would have to start to worry more about imported inflation. And, and if you think about it right now, they are trying to fight inflation as it is already. So I, I think part of the motive, uh, intention behind some of these Asian central banks actually uh, supporting their currencies a bit in recent months is also 
worries that you know if, if their currency weakens significantly further from here, it could actually exacerbate their inflation problem that they're trying to deal with right now. Right. So and I think they will all be hoping that our currency strategist, Philip Wu, is right, that the dollar cycle has more or less peaked. Yeah. So we'll see about that. Thank you very much, Duncan. No um, all right. So I promised earlier that I was going to look at the Hong Kong dollar issue a little bit. So Samuel Say, our Hong Kong-based economist, uh, he has prepared these slides for us. And um, so one thing that uh, we will look at is HKM is defending the peg. Uh, big deal, uh, because Currency Board in Hong Kong is sacrosanct. Uh, it's a number of dollars that are issued, the Hong Kong dollars that are issued by the Hong Kong Mon Monetary Authority are fully backed by the US dollar reserves that are held by the uh, Hong Kong Central Bank. Uh, but despite that, the big stress that we saw in the last few months is just as market's expectation of US dollar interest rates went up by virtue of having a currency board and therefore surrender its monetary policy to the US, Hong Kong also saw a very sharp rise in short-term interest rates. Now that's a problem for Hong Kong because unlike the US where the economy is hot, there is inflation, in the case of Hong Kong, anything but. Uh, the risk is probably for recession and deflation as opposed to inflation. So the Hong Kong economy is absorbing policies that are absolutely inappropriate for it. And hence, I suppose the market's view was that this is a time to then put some pressure on the Hong Kong dollar and see whether that fortress currency board can be undone or not. And as has been the case in the past many, many times, the short answer is no, it cannot be undone. But what has happened so far? So on the left-hand side of the chart, what we're seeing is that the gray bar, Hong Kong dollar spot rate, which is managed in an extremely tight band by the HKMA, went toward the top end of the band uh, as sort of market stress picked up. And we also saw the high bar LIBOR spread uh, turning negative and fall sharply to about 88 basis points. Um, and, and that is stressful, no, no question about it. Uh, everything that I'm gonna say right now will be that it's not a big deal, uh, Hong Kong dollar peg is fine, but this sort of stress is not a small deal either. It matters. It may not harm the currency regime, but it is a challenge for the overall uh, financial and monetary uh, environment in Hong Kong. If you look at the right-hand side chart, aggregate balance, which is you know uh, the, the bank's balances held at the HKMA, uh, have have dropped. Uh, just as you know, short-term interest rates have gone up. Uh, HKMA has intervened uh, and has tried to uh, uh, you know make sure that you know that the credibility associated with the Hong Kong dollar peg is intact by showing fairly strong determination of protecting it. But again, it's been noticed by the markets that the reserves have fallen. Um, and, and that's where the uh, following picture comes in, that FX reserve to monetary base is low. I mean, perhaps the lowest we have seen in a decade or so. Uh, and, and there's been this little dip in FX reserves. But some pressure on money markets, some increase in interest rates, some decline in reserves, they are one bucket. The Hong Kong dollar's integrity is an entirely different bucket. Then we're talking about the legal structure of Hong Kong's monetary regime and the incredible high hurdles that have to be passed before any alternative can be entertained. And we don't think from a political perspective, from an economic cycle perspective, there is just any room whatsoever to entertain any of those things. Uh, so the uh, question of also, you know, sort of repegging to RMB as opposed to Hong Kong dollar, um, as opposed to the US dollar, you know, we don't think that's possible. Uh, just in terms of RMB deposits, there is insufficient amount. And also technically, it probably would not make any sense because we're talking about a convertible currency regime versus a non-convertible currency regime as far as RMB is concerned. So the final thought on this is that as Hong Kong imports the high interest rates from the US, you will probably see significant flattening of the curve. So that's our view that in structurally speaking, the interest rate swap curve that we have in Hong Kong will flatten a lot as short-term expectations of interest rate go higher. And of course, you know, we've already seen this at the 12-month uh, high bar side, which is now at you know, 2.58. I mean, that's an amazing shock. I mean, it was less than 0.5% at the beginning of this year. It's gone up by 200 basis points since then. Uh, what is amazing is, and this is not just true for Hong Kong, but for rates market around the world, is that this sharp pickup, this couple of hundred basis points pickup in interest rate so far this year has not led to any major accidents. We haven't seen any leveraged funds go out of business. We haven't seen any huge uh, bank coming under pressure because uh, they have, uh, you know, they're seeing credit risk mounting because of high interest rates. Maybe some of those shoes will drop down the road, but so far, global financial stability seems to be very well uh, 
in very good position, uh, despite the seismic rise in interest rates, uh, I would not have seen this coming. I would have thought that this sort of delta would have led to accidents galore. So far, so good. And you know, let's, let's be happy and grateful about that. All right, that's the view on Hong Kong. We are OK with respect to the integrity of the Hong Kong dollar peg. We also see uh, short-term interest rates going up is likely to stay, love it or leave it. In this case, for Hong Kong, it has to be loved. They are stuck with it. All right, question and answers. We got some very good questions. So what I've done is we have sort of highlighted a few questions here and there for you. Uh, the first question, how do you link aggressive rate hike to tame inflation that is supply triggered with negative growth of the economy? Well, yes, a lot of inflation is supply side related, especially last year when we saw auto car prices in the US driving substantial amount of inflation. This year, when we have seen food and fuel prices drive a lot of inflation, well, they're, of course, supply side driven, as I said earlier, COVID inflation, conflict inflation, and so on. But around the world, there is also a lot of demand side inflation. Uh, shortage of goods is not just a function of supply chain problems. There is also exceptionally strong demand for them. Uh, similarly, the fact that housing prices and rents have gone up around the world, it's a function of low interest rate. As interest rates go higher, you will see some of those uh, froth go away. So the market for auto financing, rental, home financing, uh, credit card debt, those markets will be affected by high interest rates. And that's where the efficacy of interest rate hike comes in. So it's not just a question of meaningless rate hikes to deal with supply side inflation. There are many, many channels through which the demand side works. And there are areas where the Fed can certainly slow things down. So that's what I mean by, or we mean by the uh, interest rate channel then leading to some downside risk to growth. It's not going to affect the supply side. There's nothing interest rates can do with respect to the supply side. It can certainly slow the demand side. It can certainly slow wage demand down, employment growth down, and overall economic activity down. Already we're seeing examples of large retailers around the world, which stocked up very heavily last year, are now basically seeing a classic inventory recession, meaning they have too much inventory, they don't have sufficient demand, they'll just run down the inventory, they're not gonna buy a lot of stuff, and there's no question of expanding uh, capacities because over the last two years, capacity expansion has been substantial in many, many sectors in any case. So some of the overinvestment around the COVID period will face some reckoning. Some of the inventory buildup during the COVID period because of strong goods demand will face some reckoning as we switch from goods to services. And those little mistakes or those little anomalies around the cycle would lead to substantial slowdown in growth, particularly with respect to investment, but perhaps also with respect to consumption. And the final point, I don't really have a chart on that, but we need to keep that in mind, is the fiscal. All around the world, those big, large support measures that were in place in 2020 and large parts of 2021 are now gone. Cash transfers, uh, rebates on taxes, tax holidays, they're all gone. People have to pay a lot of taxes this year that they did not pay the year before, the year before that. Uh, and as a result, fiscal is going to improve the fiscal position. Uh, US Federal, Federal uh, Treasury, for example, in the first four months of this year has run a surplus. Uh, similar things can be seen around the world. So that's a huge withdrawal of stimulus from the growth dynamic as well. So fiscal shrinking, investment cycle probably facing some headwinds. Consumers may have seen the best behind them. So put it all together and you have the interest rate increase, growth will slow, no doubt. Next question, is global inflation peaking? Well, hopefully that answer was embedded in the first 20 minutes of this session where we walked over the varieties of inflation and what's happening with inflation expectations. So the answer is sort of yes. Level of prices will probably remain high for a prolonged period, meaning we're not gonna see oil go down to 80 or $60 anytime soon, but the Delta, Meaning, will oil be 150 in six months' time and then 200 the year after? No, we don't think so. We think that there's a lot of supply side developments that will come, which will abate the upward momentum on oil. So even if oil doesn't come down substantially, level will flatten or might even decline a bit. That would mean zero inflation or even disinflation because inflation is about the delta. Similarly for food, similarly for autos, similarly for chips, everywhere, we are not very gung-ho about the outlook where we see massive explosion of production and collapse in prices. But given how high prices are already, we don't think there's far more to build on. So inflation, yes, peak. Price levels, unfortunately, 
will remain high. And in many ways, that matters more than the, just the rate of inflation. That's something we worry about when we look at markets. The Federal Reserve worries about, central banks worry about. But for the average person who's paying 20% more for milk today than they did last year, even if the year on year change becomes zero 12 months from now, they will remember that two years ago they were paying much, much less. So that remains an issue. So let's not be cavalier about this point. Inflation rate may be peaking, level of prices will remain very high. Okay, this is an interesting question. I mean, when I saw this earlier today, I decided to do a little bit of homework on this. Would uh, India's, what would be India's macroeconomic strategy for petroleum imports from Russia? So now, before coming to this crisis, India did import crude from Russia, but not a lot. Uh, I think the best number that I've seen so far is about 3 to 5% of India's crude imports came from Russia. Uh, India imports largely from the Middle East and elsewhere. Now, in the last three months, India has almost trebled its import from Russia. So you could see a scenario in which in 2022, more than 10% of India's imports come from Russia and maybe even higher than that in 2023. So that's a big shift, but still not a fundamental change in India's import regime of fuel. Uh, there's a, only a limited amount of how much India can get from Russia. Russia doesn't have any pipeline coming into India, so it has to be seaborne. Uh, and there's a limit of how many seagoing vessels can bring in Russian crude. Already you're seeing some, around some sanctions. Western ships will not be able to carry Russian oil because the Western countries are basically saying you can't insure ships that are carrying Russian oil. So India will see a large pickup in its crude oil imports from Russia, but it will still be importing vast majority of its oil from the rest of the world. So when we talk about India getting 30, 40% discount, the answer is yes, it will be a relief on the margin. But I think we have already seen in the last three months or so since the war broke out, that while the market is fully aware that India has this little valve of importing cheap oil from Russia, the market still remains very worried about India's balance of, balance of payments outflow, which is why the rupee, which was hanging around at 73, 74, now is at 77 and perhaps even going higher because without with or without Russian oil, India's current account deficit is going to be substantial this year because the economy is fairly strong and oil imports are large, meaning pressure on the rupee and pressure on RBI to raise interest rates. Um, so beyond that, which is that you know, trebling of imports and making Russia about a tenth of its energy supply, I really don't see what else India can do at this juncture with respect to Russia. Uh, mind you, its trade goes both ways. India also exports a lot to Russia. But India's export to Russia has completely collapsed in the last three months. There are a lot of Indian companies that are in multinational, multinational in nature. They would worry about sanctions, both direct and secondary, if they were to continue trading relationship with Russia. So all of a sudden, India's surplus vis-a-vis -vis Russia has become into a, turning into a deficit, if you will, because its oil imports have gone up a lot, whereas its exports to Russia have completely collapsed, which also will not make India very, very happy. Uh, and so we will see. Uh, how far India can take this relationship, especially since it remains also very big allies to uh, Western economies. Final question, and this will be the last question, and we will then wrap up the live stream. Um, we are facing uh, the headwind of high inflation in the current circumstances. What are the elements to drive inflation to stay higher, high, even higher, and what are the reasons to lower the inflation? So basic question, going forward, having said everything about inflation so far, what could drive inflation even higher? What could drive inflation lower? Uh, let's take the second part. That's the easier answer. Uh, a complete collapse in demand would drive inflation lower, regardless of how tight the supply side is. If we see China struggling to come out of its COVID-0 policy, if we see Europe consumers becoming very, very negative about the outlook because of the war, and if we see in Americans uh, unhappy with high fuel prices and high interest rates go on a strike as far as their you know, seemingly insatiable demand for goods and services, then trust me, inflation will not be the issue that we'll be worried about. So to me, that stagflationary question, I think is only relevant right now for crude oil and perhaps gas. Beyond that, demand will correct all other inflationary impulses in my view, and that's the risk uh, going forward. Now, what could push inflation even higher? Well, a soft landing in the US where growth slows modestly despite the Fed taking Fed funds rate to around 3% or so could actually be an unhappy situation for everybody. Fed takes inf interest rates to 3%, US economy slows to let's say 1%, but inflation remains at 
because the demand for goods and services is still substantial. To me, this may well be the central scenario for 2023. Fed takes interest rates high, inflation remains high, growth slows down. It's not an outright stagflationary scenario because inflation will have come down from 8% in 2022 to 4% in 2023. Growth will go from 3% in 2022 to 1% in 2023. So growth slows, inflation slows. But it will feel kind of stagflationary because 4% inflation from the Fed's perspective is still very high. So I think that's the key issue, which is the Fed hikes are substantial to slow growth down, but not substantial enough to bring down inflation in 2023. That becomes a 24 scenario. Then, of course, you could see a situation where the Fed is forced to keep hiking, and then we're talking about an outright recessionary scenario. But before that happens, we might be talking about stagflation or stagflation type feeling for a prolonged period. And the other risk of um, massive inflation on top of what we have is further exacerbation of the war in Ukraine, where Russia also takes action to ban exports of uh, gas and crude oil to the rest of the world except for its allies. And then we see a bit energy squeeze where my baseline assumption is that Russia doesn't do a whole lot. And we see heroic response on the supply side from US, Latin America, and uh, the Middle East. Already on the gas side, where there's certainly a genuine supply demand imbalance if Russia is taken out of the equation, uh, we can see that the European countries are making a lot of overtures to African countries, which probably will be the big story next in terms of gas supply to, to supplement or replace all the stuff that Europe is getting out of uh, Russia. So sanctions and energy security related concerns are not going to evade anytime soon. They might be the big spoiler and keep inflation elevated, but it still will not be a 1970s style situation in my view, because in the 1970s, you had fiscal policy, wage policies at a very different uh, trajectory, and also credibility of the Fed was very little. We have a credible Fed. We don't have that much union power in the West to bargain or index wage up. And we also don't have fiscal policy calibrating towards supporting demand. It's actually subtracting from demand. So let's not be so gloomy and start thinking about stagflationary situation. It may feel like stagflation, but chances are we could also see with equal probability a soft landing in 2022 and 23 and beyond. With that, we will end the June Macro Insights live streams. Thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon and uh, watching us on the Contiki platform or the recorded version on YouTube. Uh, thanks to the uh, communications team and marketing team of DBS for helping us set this up. We will see you again in July. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.